You're listening to Access to Perspectives Conversations. My name is Joe Haverman, and I'm here today with Martin Delahanty, who's a, like Delahanty is an Irish name, and you're based in London, and you're um, the CEO of Inspiring STEM, um, a strategy, communications, and engagement consultancy. Um, welcome, first of all. Very warm welcome, Martin. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Joe, and, and lovely to join you as well, and a fellow podcaster. Yeah, uh, of course, yeah, we're, surely we are get, getting there to talk about the exciting conversations you're having in your podcast show, and which can also be found on our website um, uh, under recommended podcast shows, all of which are in the realm of open science. So yeah, so let's let's get into our long plan discussion on the intersections of open science towards knowledge transfer, what can open science and open access do or how can practicing open science um, allow researchers to have an impact on society or like wherever the research is gonna lead us um, because accumulating knowledge is one thing and that might be very much true and beneficial for basic research while well, much basic research is where I'm coming from with biosciences and evolution or biology um, has eventually an, uh, an impact on any research field really wherever it's been taken up into. Um, so maybe let's let's get started by getting no, getting um, learning more about you and your background what brought you to open your um, your company inspiring stem and um yeah the kind of work you currently do and also yeah what what the podcast maybe plays what what role the podcast plays in the work you do as a consultant and and trainer and um, expert for research management research or science communication at large and open science where we all both have um explicit interests and also expertise in yeah, and open science is, is where it's at at the moment because it's it's just the perennial discussion. And so my, my background is 30 years in scientific publishing. I started out, out as a copy editor and proofreader before the age of a computer, which is take me back some. I had a red pen and a blue pen and hard copy manuscripts and uh, an in-tray and out-tray. So I was there at the coal face very early on doing science editing and trained as a, a science editor and then progressed through uh, various different stages and iterations of the scholarly publishing industry. And I have uh, uh, to fully declare the fact that I've worked for many commercial publishers, uh, Elsevier twice, Springer Nature more recently, who was my last employer, uh, and within that group, the, the Nature Research Publications. So my background is in scholarly and scientific publishing, journals publishing, a little bit of book publishing, but working very closely with academic institutions, uh, professional membership associations involved in progressing science research. Um, and uh, really almost 15 years ago, beginning to think about open access and explaining what open access publishing is and isn't, uh, and continuing to do that now as an independent consultant. So I'm in year five of uh, Inspiring STEM Consulting. So we're a, a private limited company. We provide consulting services for a whole range of stakeholders in the scholarly publishing ecosystem from, yes, publishers, but also pharmaceutical companies. So uh, all my clients are declared on my website. So for example, I do work for Pfizer and the publications team in Pfizer in New York. I work for World Scientific Publishing in uh, Singapore, which is great because then I get an Asian, Asia Pacific perspective on scholarly publishing. Mm -hmm. um, I work for uh, publishing services uh, vendors. Um, currently, I'm a publishing advisor for a company called Amnet Systems in Chennai, and they are developing a open access, open science enabled publishing platform and peer review system. So, and I work, I work, uh, also for government agencies so i'm doing some work now for the national institute of health research uh, they have a open access publications program 
So it's actually very hard to find a piece of work that I'm doing or a client within my sphere who's not currently challenged or interested or both around open access and open mm -hmm. science, which is good. And then my, uh, I think uh, somebody asked me recently, well, what's your greatest achievement? And I think in publishing, my, my proudest moment was developing the Nature Partner Journals mm -hmm. within nature uh, from literally scratch. It was myself and two colleagues who uh, you know, came together with management support to develop a new idea for a partnership series of journals with uh, a flavor of nature in the title, Nature Partner Journals. Uh, but the, for the first time launching open access journals, this is back in 2014, uh, developing fully open access journals under a nature brand, which had never been done before. Mm -hmm. This is when Nature Communications was still a, a hybrid journal, so offered subscription and open access route before went eventually open access. Mm -hmm. um, and then left uh, in left Springer Nature in uh, September 2017. Um, uh, very very happily on both sides. Uh, decided to do something different. Uh, a little, uh, uh, as many people do in life, you've got a, a little uh, focus on your health when you're working 100 miles an hour and doing 100,000 flying miles a year and having mm -hmm. fantastic time being a publisher. And then your body says um, you probably should stop for particular reasons so uh, I had a health incident which stopped me in my tracks and thought well perhaps I should just sort of step back a little bit and um, do something maybe different and consulting really has been a fantastic opportunity for me to connect then with a, a wide set of stakeholders within scholarly publishing um, and to then bring that perspective to bear and share that that knowledge with you know people like yourself and you know through uh, events seminars which very nicely I'm, I'm asked to to present at is just to share that holistic view from multiple stakeholder points of view mm -hmm. uh, and then try and bring it all together into something that's very very practical so um that's in a nutshell what my, <laughs> my career over the last 30 years in publishing i did do a degree in natural sciences at trinity college in dublin I worked for a couple of years as a medical researcher in Crumlin Children's Hospital, and then I came to London to do a PhD, decided within 12 months that uh, working in a laboratory was really not for me. And luckily, my head of laboratory was married to a scientific publisher, and she said, had you ever thought about publishing? I said, no, nope, nobody's ever told me about scientific publishing. <laughs> what is that? And the rest, <laughs> rest is history. <laughs> but uh, I'm still finding... Uh, PhDs and academics and postgrads who are thinking about transitioning out of science and they're just not told about the opportunities within scholarly publishing or scholarly communications or science communications which is your area it's just a, a fantastic career because it's so diverse and there is so much need at the moment and uh, yeah. more recently with COVID clearly there's a, a massive need for effective science communications that are accurate authenticated and uh, cut through any fake news out there mm. so the role of science communicators has been really you know if it hadn't already been validated it's you know in the post-covid world has really been yeah. validated and um yeah it's great i mean the whole landscape around not knowledge communication within science is a fantastic area to work with and you know i spent a little bit of time promoting that to to post uh, to PhDs who are looking to transition out of science and just sort of presenting those opportunities, what, what I call knowledge-based careers, one of which is science, uh, scientific publishing, another is science communications, uh, other areas or tech companies that are looking to develop um, uh, workflow tools for scientific researchers. So an example would be Digital Science, a fantastic company. Uh, which I was very lucky enough at Nature to work alongside mm -hmm. developing some incredible innovative tools like Figshare and Altmetric to support researcher workflows. And many of the uh, the CEOs of those companies that came looking for seed funding, many of those were PhDs, sort of academics who decided they wanted to transition out 
Mm. Mark Hanel is a very good example with Fix yeah, Share. He's, he's been on the show, so the episode will be released by the time this one is released, for sure. Ah, there but you go. I didn't know. Be released. <laughs> and Mark's been on the show and was really yeah, lucky for uh, as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a whole dynamic within scientific science communications and mm. uh, a whole different set of perspectives that need to be brought together. And underpinning all that now is open science. Yeah, I feel like many of the tools like Figshare have been rather recently or within the past decade or a little bit more by now, developed by um, researchers. And Mar Mark also shared that he just wanted an outlet where he could easily share his data to kind of prove and, and showcase what his research communication, like the manuscripts and the papers would refer to. Um, and then there was no outlet, really. And um, so he created his own. <laughs> and that's Fixture today. Um, and it's been functioning up and running. And I think there was a quick uptake um, when I was a PhD student when they launched. And yeah, it's grown into a massive, super useful. I think he's been piloting a lot of the repository services um, or kind of re, how do you say, it? repositories 2.0 is mm -hmm. what picture and now others um deliver like yeah and then he's also pushing for an in increased interconnectivity between different systems so that's i think the current challenge mm. how to interconnect all these like naturally in silos developed systems how can we create an yeah, uh, like access to all of the research work that's being deposited in various systems mm. to make that easily accessible for the researchers and other stakeholders. Um, so yeah, so just briefly, and we, we can also dig into dig deeper into the podcast shows and the, the guests um, that you had, or maybe we do that now, like how, how do, do you feel the conversations you have with your podcast inform the work that you do as a consultant is that like another like like do you, do you, does that give you a new perspective on your own work um having these conversations in this format like i i can only say like for me this is really uplifting like the podcast format is such a nice venue mm -hmm. to bounce ideas and thoughts and experiences for as experts and to learn massive, massively with each guest on the show. Is it, is it the same for you? It's the same for me. I mean, it just, you, you uh, put two, two or three people in a podcast room and you learn something new. And, mm -hmm. you know, the reason I continue to do it, and I'm sure you continue to do it, is that, you know, at every point I learn something new and also that I can share some insights as well from, from my perspective by having a conversation. Mm -hmm. So, um, as with your podcast, my, my format is very conversational. So, um, uh, I had, um, uh, Jamie Carmichael, who is, um, a senior director at uh, the copyright clearance center. And so she has talked, um, quite frequently around, um, inequity and open access and how to address that, that challenge. Um, so we had a podcast a couple of weeks ago, but, uh, it was, it was almost the, uh, the tables were turned where she was interviewing me <laughs> which yeah. was fine but it worked out to be you know a very productive conversation which is what, what i like so um i always learn something new and hopefully people that uh, i'm interacting with and who can use the podcast as a platform to share their perspectives also get value um not all but nearly all of the podcast themes have been around um open access and open science so naturally the po the podcast is is published under ccby license so i encourage everybody and anybody to reuse the content um they can have the uh, the raw mp3 files if they want to to use it through their own uh, systems but um i've also focused on just because i'm inquisitive and that's sort of my inherent sort of Bit of science DNA that I have. I don't have a huge amount of science DNA because I wasn't a very good laboratory technician, but mm. um, um, hence my segue into publishing. But that inquisitiveness 
is -hmm. always there. So I'm just interested to talk to interesting people who are doing interesting things in publishing. And I talked to uh, Monica Moniz at uh, Cambridge University Press, and we had a great conversation around research directions, which is looks and feels like a journal, but is different. It's a series of journals uh, under uh, a um, uh, a theme called research directions. And under that banner, they they have, for example, one journals is around One Health, which is uh, you know a real challenge is to sort of bring bring together both uh, human and animal health studies into uh, you know, more of a holistic view on um, health mm. and global health. And so it tries to break down a traditional journal article into individual components and to create more of a threaded story. So there's a, a data article, there's a protocol, there's a, a research impact piece. So those elements would be published separately. Um, their impact can be measured. So I try and focus on people that are doing something new and innovative. Another example would be uh, you and Adi. So you and I uh, worked together while he was at Digital Science developing Altmetric very successfully. And then he's now moved on to create a, another product to track uh, policy influence within science and academia um, is that interface between research and policy and COVID clearly has concentrated everybody's mind on the influence of research immediate influence of research on policy and you have mm. the case of preprints now coming to the fore by, by archive and by uh, uh, your med archive being very well established because of COVID. And I think pre COVID were still beginning to try and establish their, what they were and, and how they served a purpose within clinical biomedical scientific uh, publishing, but they've certainly justified their, their existence, but you have the case of COVID related uh, research being published as, as preprints the week before then CTC making a policy change health policy change based on those those preprints mm -hmm. which is amazing so the you know the world of clinical biomedical science has woken up to the, the to, to be more understanding of preprints yes they're not peer-reviewed but to be more trusting of the scientific process whereas uh, within the physics mathematicals uh, mathematics and computing communities archive has been the sole, almost like the sole publication vehicle for the past 25 years. So it's, it's just well established in those fields. It's just, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's how you advance science. It's just not been the case within clinical biomedical science. And, you know, you also have in clinical biomedical science, the, uh, the influence of the, the, the glamour journals, the prestige journals, nature science, JAMA, NIJM. Um, of course, you know, they're, icons of scientific publishing but they're they're not the the, the sole vehicles for great research and uh, i think there's been much of a much more of a, a leveling of the playing field with the likes of preprint servers but before that plus and scientific reports where you've got a platform for good sound science to be published negative results to be published so that there's you know, you avoid waste in the scientific system because we know there's huge amounts of waste, mm -hmm. uh, both in resources, funding, and just time spent on replication of unnecessary replication of research because it's just not been published and not, not been put out there. Um, yeah, so we could talk for hours about mm -hmm. all, all the challenges, opportunities, but really, really fascinating uh, interesting innovations that are going on and that's yeah you know, that's part of my business that's part of you know an element of the the podcast series that uh, I want to talk to people who also want to share a different view on what they're doing mm -hmm. um, as as you do as well and then to you know uh, if, if possible provide a, an appropriate platform then to to raise any 
issues around policy and practice within within science and how to address some of the challenges there, particularly inequity within the uh, uh, scientific system and op open access publishing has raised that challenge where if it's tied to, for example, article processing charges, then there's a financial barrier to uh, lower and middle income countries um, to publishing in those journals. Whereas under a subscription model, there wasn't, but then there's no access to, to that work. So there are some really great healthy discussions around uh, equity within scientific and scholarly publishing uh, and having access to that information. Uh, just uh, today, actually, my, my current podcast uh, published this morning was with um, uh, Knowledge E and Cameron Cardan, who's the CEO of Knowledge E in, in Dubai. And they have a product called Zendi, which is about providing affordable access to uh, scientific re research and literature, particularly for those researchers that are not attached to large institutions and their scientific disciplines, many scientific disciplines uh, where the science is driven by individual researchers who are not mm -hmm. attached to large universities and don't have access to institutional uh, repositories uh, courtesy of those uh, large institutions, the mm -hmm. individual researchers. So and of course, you, you, in, when we get to talking then about uh, addressing inequity you know you you know we had a, a great conversation just sort of prepping for for this podcast talking about uh africa archive and all the great work that you're doing there to to try and redress the imbalance yeah so i mean i think there are several options and and you've suddenly also learned and saw in action alternative models on how publishing can function um and a few publishers like PLOS and also some nature journals have already adopted a preprint to journal workflow to have to have green open access and then for the and therefore like self-archive or archive in an open access repository like preprint repositories <clears throat> where in many like in Africa archive you can also as well deposit your data sets so it's a one-stop shop at the same time and now I think it could be that some editorial teams fear, but then what, or also researchers might ask, so what's the added value by a journal then? Why would we still consider journal publishing if we can make our, mm. our findings freely accessible at no cost? Um, but I personally think there is still a need for curation. And isn't that also the original mm. purpose of having journals in the first place? Now that we produce so much output, all around the world, like there's an ever increasing number of scholars and PhD students who run more or less the same experiments because like so far there's some curation, but not serving the mass of output that's being produced, I would guess, assume. So, I, okay, so, so that's basically what, how I would argue where journals still have an important role to play. And we have also considered to do some curation on our own end, but that would take a whole a whole other workload or would you know, add to the workload we already have with a small team. So yeah, so again, I think that's where journals have a beautiful role to play to it's okay. And then the, the paradigm might also shift in the sense that um, researchers are not betting to be chosen for submission by the editorial teams or reviews, but um, the tides would change in the sense that then journals can bid for um, research outputs will be published in their journal and not based on whatever, um, I mean, of course, quality measure, but that's also something we, we talk about the quality assurance part. But mm. that could then be based really on the scope of the journal. And then they can use algorithms to find articles that are already accessible um, and then suggest for the authors to have those published in their journal 
because it makes a lot of sense in the series series of contents that they've already um, curated to mm. to tell the bigger story kind of thing to to be the place for knowledge transfer to really happen because <laughs> another aspect is it's not enough with open access i mean that's good and fine it's a good start but knowledge transfer can only happen when there's actual process of information mm-hmm. and the the language where in which we present research outcomes currently i mean yes it's well for the most part probably most mostly in the biosciences in english but irrespective of the actual language there's also a discipline specific lingo which is hard to understand even when you work in the same discipline but on a different topic there's no way to understand what's going on so we need people to actually translate that into comprehensible bits of information what does that now mean for society and who's going to make those connections mm-hmm. have you seen any solutions to these kind of knowledge transfer challenges that we're currently facing due to the amount of knowledge we are producing in the research and academic fields? Of course, the amount of knowledge being produced is vast and increasing exponentially, uh, which in one sense is a good thing, particularly for encouraging the publication of work that traditionally would not have been published, that would have been hidden. Um, And there's probably well, the two things that will drive success in curating and interpreting data information and, and converting it into knowledge where that knowledge then has action so you know i would see knowledge as something that has uh, actionable points to it whereas information is mm. you know, it doesn't have any uh, application until you curate it now you, you can use obviously lots and lots of interest now in artificial intelligence and machine learning to process but the good conversations i've i've heard recently and at london book fair last week which was um the first book fair in a couple of years which was great so people were very very keen to to meet and listen and learn and i on last thursday i attended the research and scholarly publishing uh, session which was really good as well lots of again learning something new all the time and a brilliant presentation from Hong Xu at uh, Atapon. So he presented various different applications of artificial intelligence in scholarly publishing from an Atapon point of view. So, you know, data analytics uh, expert uh, point of view, but underpinning all of that is still the need for human interaction and human application of a curation process and also the fact that uh, the uh, the data out is as good as the data in and a lot of the data coming in is is terrible it's not Mm. tagged correctly so metadata and applying metadata is happening applying persistent identifiers such as orchid obviously Mm. doi for many many years but more recently orchid and other persistent identifiers that can be applied, but they're not being applied consistently, which means that the data in and the data out, you know, the accuracy is still only going to be 60, 70%. And that may be good enough with a human science curation on top of that saying, well, in all probability, this is of value or not. Mm. Um, if you are relying on uh, accuracy of data in within a machine learning artificial intelligence application if you're a self-driving car you need 100 percent accuracy otherwise you're dead <laughs> so mm-hmm. with um, science i think we have to accept that there's, there's going to be a level of inaccuracy which will then necessitate a expert view and that view will still be subjective you know Mm. we know that the peer review process for any journal whether it's lancet or whether it's you know uh, other journals specialist journals within academia peer review is subjective and it's flawed Uh, also subjective is not necessarily a bad thing per se 
it's just a matter of being aware and therefore seek feedback and review and that's also common practice from at least two or more reviewers to to balance and normalize that bias yeah so yeah i mean yeah, it's a whole discussion on its but, own but yeah. i think what we you know again COVID has really amplified mm. uh, peer-reviewed publications where peer review was seen as the you know the 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 panacea for this work is just totally credible we clearly we've seen we've seen mistakes being made mm. with with you know, many journals um and that's those mistakes have been corrected because those journals have been published open access tagged with data where then other researchers in the field can find that, interpret it, interpret the data, and then very quickly say there's some flaws in the data. Mm. There's some fundamental flaws in the data. Now, if that had been published behind a subscription firewall in a prestigious journal, that would have never been found. Um, and that would never have been discovered perhaps for 10, 15, 20 years until sure. somebody tripped over it. So making yeah, they're really, really good examples uh, during COVID of the value of metadata, persistent identifiers, and making data, underlying data alongside original research articles accessible, fully accessible, and inviting open peer review in whatever form that might be. So it's either a preprint server where it's, again, not peer reviewed, but the community is reviewing that data and mm -hmm. interrogating the data and pointing out flaws in the data. Similarly for peer reviewed articles that are made open access through COVID. So every publisher, you know, there was no way that they could not make COVID research open access. They had to make it open access. Mm -hmm. um, but by doing so also they opened it up to interrogation and that identified, you know, some flaws so we know the value of that, of that, that curation, community-based curation, and the validation of scientific publications through the use of persistent identifiers and through the use of metadata um, to give a level of assurity, but which still needs a human intervention, a human curation of that work. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with what you said. And I also would like to add that, like what, what I've read from archive, I think there's been a study on, there's been many studies on mm. the quality of peer review and the biases that come with it. And also the doubt or the concern that's often raised for preprints is, um, but what if then we have masses of, of kind of junk research out there on the internet? But peer, uh, archive.org, they testify that like what we've seen in 25 plus years, that's like 90, I don't know how much percent is of highest quality because no researcher uh, wants to make a fool of themselves by publishing mm. anything on the mm. internet, which can be kind of ripped in piece, into pieces in the you know, milliseconds <laughs> once it's online. Mm. And I think what's needed and what I haven't seen so far is... Uh, yeah, is, is to have kind of open access, preprint level publication systems with, I mean, we have these commenting sections, we have, um, I mean, there's, there's many providers of peer review platforms and communities now. One we closely work with is also pre-review. Um, and I think what would be nice to add and it's probably also difficult to set set up technically is for the commenting and reviewing that's happening on each item, like on each data set or manuscript or both, um, <clears throat> to basically have validation um, markings of some sort, like a star mm -hmm. or whatever rating system with comments to it, to specifically express where any concerns might be mentioned but also to testify the expertise of the individuals who comment. Mm. Because how does it help if a philosophist looks at a bioscience paper and expresses concerns, but has no understanding of the science behind? 
And this is, I think, what we also often see in, in close peer review, where there is a lack of reviewers or reviewers are usually researchers who are already overworked. So for most, if not all journals and editorial teams, it's super difficult to find reviewers mm -hmm. or enough thereof to, and for them to then make time to do a thorough review. So, but I think that's, that's I mean, that's the original idea with peer review to have an expert in the field to assess and verify a presentation of results of some sort. So the commenting also here alone is, is good. And there's like the factor of crowd commenting and then hopefully, you know, the crowd will have mm -hmm. reasonable opinions about it. But mm -hmm. then also from what I've seen, there's very little of that happening unless it's being curated again. And that again comes with a lot of work. So yeah. How how have um, African researchers viewed uh, Africa Archive? What kind of feedback are you getting? Um, well, there's a lot of advocacy also across the continent. Mm. Um, I personally thought the uptake would be much quicker, but as everywhere in the world, um, there's much resistance because careers depend on journal publishing and people know that and anything new is in security in the period of the trajectory but for the reasoning of of sharing outcomes free of charge of course that's that's welcomed people worry about yeah is it an established system would it be accepted can i still publish to secure my career um, advancements and, and the, there's no answers to this. So today, I mean, we would say, yes, of course, but then there's so many decision makers along the way at the respective university in the editorial teams of whichever journals where people are in between and they have an opinion of either or, either they say, yes, of course, we are totally for preprint publishing or no, we're still transitioning. We don't have clear policies around that. So maybe not, and then we have too many applications anyway. So we just pick them where we have this novel, nowhere else published effect. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the problem, like any in like transitional state where the rules are not clearly laid out for the researchers, uptake will be slow and difficult. But I mean, the reasoning makes sense for everyone. Like here's a place where you can show your work. And that's what we want as researchers, right? I mean, we would guess. <laughs> yeah, so why why do we do research? I mean, yes, to accumulate knowledge and then what? And we spoke about this also prepping for this mm. conversation. Like, uh, let's maybe give a few minutes to knowledge transfer. Like the researchers might not have to worry about that, but what do we do with all this accumulated knowledge when I mean, we touched on this earlier? And is that, do you see that in the publishing um, do you see responsibility for knowledge transfer into society and industry and all the stakeholders that could possibly make use of the research outcomes? Um, yeah, is that on the publisher side or do we need other, do we need to create new job markets to build bridges for knowledge transfer? I, I think it, it, it'll require uh, a collaboration. I know you've, you've written about you know, collaboration amongst uh, research communities. And I, I think that's, it, it'll come from the research community themselves, not from the commercial publishers who have, you know, obviously a commercial uh, interest in what they're doing, a competitive interest. Um, yeah, I think it's, it always has to be community led. And, you know, that's, that's difficult because it relies on individuals, so like yourself. And, uh, you know, we, we talked previously about the, the great, uh, late uh, John Tennant as well. So, you know, the likes, uh, uh, the, you know, individuals leading community-based action to try and change the status quo uh, and taking the evidence-based approach. I think that's what's what's brilliant is that you, you uh, by taking that evidence-based approach, you can, you can counter any argument against doing something new or doing something different. Mm. And um, 
my one of my mantras with with clients is you know I, I say well my approach will always be evidence based it's not my subjective view I will try and bring evidence to bear if there's no evidence bibliometric evidence or market evidence then it, it would be very difficult for me to make I won't make a recommendation without some evidence behind this and have some scenario testing um, and that's that's where um, you know we've got uh, fantastic data scientists, bibliometricians out there, um, science literature experts within various communities that are collaborating uh, really, really well to bring together a consensus view of the right way forward, the right way for knowledge sharing, and to address all the challenges around inequity, around waste within the scientific system, uh, the lack of uh, voice for certain communities within disciplines that are maybe not well supported or well funded you know, if you're an oncologist or cardiologist you're going to have super funding for your voice your research and a platform for publication where you know you will have impact um, but if you're working in areas of biodiversity or in social sciences humanities it's going to be much more difficult isn't it so mm -hmm. that's that's just just how it is um yeah so i, I think community-based action has already changed the landscape and open open science and I, i'm trying now to talk more about open science rather than open access and somebody um uh, editorial board member for one of my uh, client journals asked me recently oh, isn't open access and open science interchangeable it's the same thing I'm, I'm trying to say well actually it's not open science is the you know, the, the very broad umbrella under which open access publishing is just a mechanism to achieve public uh, pub, open publication route. You have un, open data, open standards, you've got metadata, persistent identifiers, the whole range. Open uh, peer review, uh, open source, software and hardware. Yes. Um, yeah, there's plenty of citizen science, um, like, yeah, the again, the intersection to society and what role um, citizens can play to inform research, like to have to have a dialogue with society, really, yes. what many mm. citizen science mm. are about, projects are about. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. So the, yeah, taxonomy, yeah, the taxonomy of open science is just so rich and diverse, but it's, uh, it's not well communicated. Mm. And we keep coming back to open access publishing being, you know, I think you said, you said it as well when we were talking before is, you know, okay, we understand open access because we are going to understand open access publishing. Let's move on to talk about something else, but no, you, you don't. That's just a mechanism by which you can achieve a component of open science. Mm -hmm. It's much, much broader. And it does come down to the societal benefit for science. So making that connection between research policy and change and benefit for society benefit for patient groups pay, whatever but uh, tracking the <clears throat> the ultimate benefit and feeding back to then either re repeating or not repeating work there's still a huge amount of work to be done and being able to communicate data around that research policy interface is a big big challenge it's been challenged for everybody but i'm seeing much more conversation now so i mentioned you and Addy before who's now developed um a, a new product uh, called overton and so overton is looking at that science policy interface working with the united nations with oecd other ngos uh, looking at policy interface between science and uh, application which is very very interesting because that that's that's been lacking for so long and um, if you can apply tools to measure and provide some metrics that will help the conversation hugely so um data is everything i think metadata mm -hmm. yeah. persistent identifiers and authenticators the, the more data that you can embed within uh, research content and research output and research workflows as well so you know there, there needs to be much more discussion around uh, more efficient 
workflows within science, mm. uh, the interaction between scientific workflows within laboratory to repository to end user, um, all those infrastructures require a new expertise as well. And, um, you know, the evolution of data science scientists as the new custodians of knowledge within university systems, I think are spe you know, a spectacular leap forward and uh, really interesting as a, a career move. Again, I, you know, I talk uh, quite a bit about transitioning from uh, laboratory and academia to knowledge-based careers. And one of the career segues that I promote is, you know, becoming a data scientist and training to be a data scientist if you come from a, a scientific background mm -hmm. because there's a huge demand to curate that data to manage the data to apply uh, systems and processes to data to make it more efficient and effective um break no, that's out. also what i personally could spend hours days and years on just doing massaging databases optimizing cleaning up uh, well or conceptualizing, I think more more of the conceptualizing, but also some of the cleaning because it's so beautiful when you see a data set come to life to mm -hmm. then also be able to use data visualization tools and software. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, to actually learn from the data is only possible after you clean it up mm -hmm. um, for, yeah. So what does clean up really mean is not deleting unwanted data points, but to yeah to put it in order to make it human and machine readable so that the software can actually process it um yeah not to be confused with um cherry picking data points mm. but just mm. in it, like managing the data in a way that's that's processable and then it can be of use so therefore it's again astonishing that some for so much time there's been publications of research outcome where there are surely underlying data sets somewhere available, but so, well, not so well curated and oftentimes not accessible to, to anyone really to use. I mean, only once then bioscientists and like as a, I think numerically relevant example, um, when they leave academia to find placements in the industry, and then they probably start their research from scratch again to produce data sets, which then can only be used within that company mm -hmm. for market share and acquisition. But so I think that's also something I've come across at some point. And yeah, how is is there is there a way through open science to allow the universities to keep ownership of data sets and still make it available also for the industry and the industry to appreciate that and not fear that they will lose on market share and profit um, making possibilities but see their their purpose in yeah adding to the value chain and being able to gain enough profit for a sustainable business model through that and then the data can be open between the sectors. That's what I'm mm -hmm. hoping for. Uh, the, the tension will always be between uh, you know, scientific data and advances in science to share that data uh, within a, a commercial environment, particularly where you've got a, an a, you know, uh, academic institution working with a commercial company to, to partner on research. You know, an endpoint will be a patent on a product or a patent on a drug or a patent on some new innovation to generate economic benefit for both partners, including yeah. the, the university. So you know, you've got many universities now that are setting up limited companies in collaboration with commercial companies to, to commercialize their output. Mm -hmm. In one sense, that's good because it attracts, you know, the, the necessary investment, mm. but then it'll still, it still will have to tread that fine line between you know, open science and protecting uh, 
innovation and com being competitive because mm. you will still have to be competitive to generate a profit if that's that's what many many in universities are looking at right now is you know to to generate additional revenue streams and that's a necessity after covid you've got a dramatic mm. reduction in the number of uh, overseas students for many universities you know, australia is a good example where they were highly reliant on um overseas students mm. you know once you begin to lose that revenue stream as a as a university to fund your operations then you need to look at other areas and you know if research innovation innovation around you know, new new technologies like quantum uh, i had the, uh, the great pleasure of working with the university of new south wales on developing a journal on quantum and having an insight into uh, their strategic focus on quantum technologies as a you know a commercial benefit that would support the operations of the university they're really really focused really really connected with industry and you know many other sectors as well where universities are doing that to mm. offset losses in other income streams particularly overseas students that you know tend to be quite lucrative for okay for universities um and i wasn't aware of that dilemma like as a result of covid but it's it's yeah it's totally understandable not when you talk about it um and do you see there's also a chance for non-profits and for-profit entities to actually get together and collaborate on bigger challenges similar to mark spoke also about a a funding that they've received as a repository to work together with, for example, the Center for Open Science and other stakeholders mm -hmm. um, who all specialize in repository services. And clearly, Figshare is commercial for also for reasons of being able to stay flexible, for being able to protect their business idea from being copied by bigger fish in the pond <laughs> um, at the time. And because it works for them. And I think also there's nothing bad about whichever taxation model, mm -hmm. um, as long as the purpose is the focus of operations. Um, so for them, apparently it works, or they now received a grant from NIH, um, the national US National Institute of Health, mm -hmm. um, to yeah, to collaborate and establish a repository system that is interoperable for medical research in the United States, which can then be modeled also for other regions and disciplines. And I think that's a beautiful example of how also different sectors, different um, taxation models, <laughs> um, mm, mm. for profits, non profits can work together to make, yeah, to provide solutions at a larger scale, as we also need with these global challenges we're facing. And that's only to address like health um, focused research, science communication, really. Um, yeah, to make that research output in in health in the United States accessible and interoperable. Um, and we also have climate change. We also have peace and conflict studies. We also have like no no with with wars, um, not only in Ukraine. Um, between Ukraine and Russia, but also other places around the world. Um, so there's a high need of yeah, societal actors to really come together and provide the solutions or the means for other entities to then again to come up with the solutions that we all so desperately need. Mm. So in, in your conversations, did you see a tendency towards that or, or do you feel hopeful that this will that we will see more of such kind of collaborations and meta facilitations of knowledge transfer and knowledge, how, how it's going to call it, yeah, research I'm, accessibility. Yes, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful because, you know, the, the, the key word also you mentioned there, interoperability. And so oh. interoperability will then force those uh, vendors of knowledge-based systems, commercial vendors of knowledge-based systems to ensure that they connect. Because if they don't, then those systems will cease to be used. And that's, um, you know, the real call to action from the research community is that if you provide commercial tools for which we will, you know, 
will pay a competitive price for those commercial tools. They need to be interoperable with all the other products and services that we use. It needs to be interoperable with our repository, yeah. both nationally and internationally. So you're beginning to see you know, the development of international data repositories. Let's hope that continues. Clearly, we, we now are moving from a world that was focused on globalization to a world that's closing down to be more a set of nationalist agendas. Um, yeah, there's a tendency. Let's hope we still find a way out of that tendency. <laughs> and then, well, ho hopefully through that, the, the principle mm. that science is apolitical non-political it should not be influenced and in that uh, mm. it should be open it should be a truly international endeavor clearly that's that's just ch going to be challenged through nationalist agendas uh, because of then the underlying need to be competitive and uh, yeah that that's a real tension and mm. you can see that already in not just with ukraine but you know what went on uh, previously with the previous administration in the United States. Um, yeah, that just creates that unnecessary additional pressure when there's great collaboration, international collaboration going on. Uh, great work to connect previously siloed knowledge-based systems to be more interoperable, to be more accountable, uh, and to work to international standards as well. Mm -hmm. And um, international data standards are still, you know, still challenging to find a set of standards that are internationally recognized. But, and I've been involved in conversations with, um, uh, I do quite a bit of work, uh, uh, obviously work for the European Medical Rights Association. We, we have great conferences, great events. We've got one coming up uh, a little plug for Berlin uh, from the uh, 3rd to the 7th of May. Mm -hmm. Place is still available. <laughs> We've got uh, European Medical Rights Association. Uh, first face-to-face -face meeting for two and a half years. Again, very exciting. And I'm running a uh, afternoon uh, expert seminar series on the real world impact of open science. So I, I, yeah, it's unavoidable good. that whatever I do is connected with open science. Mm. Um, but in, in the past, we've been talking about um, the challenges around lack of interoperability of, of data and systems uh, within, for example, pharmaceutical companies and clinical trial data, and the challenges there about making data open and accessible, but without, you know, with maintaining confidentiality and maintaining commercial benefit for mm individual companies to it's it's a complex system but no. um, there's great work being done to advance a way forward to you know deal with all of those challenges within the pharmaceutical industry and to to ensure that um, there's less waste within clinical trials because there's vast waste within clinical trials there are many many clinical trials that never get past phase one where that data is then locked away it's never published mm. um it's not published in a, a clinical trial registry it's another you know big challenge um for anybody who's interested in that area uh, ben goldacre is is been talking about the lack of transparency around uh, clinical data for about 20 years so he's a good good person to uh, uh keep track of um very vocal around those challenges mm -hmm. um yeah, but I'm very hopeful for the way things are moving forward because we're seeing, you know, good discussions around open science, an increasing understanding of what open science is and what it isn't, um, and creating infrastructures and systems that will uh, advance open science. Yeah, well, yeah, that's exciting. Um, together with my colleague Louise Besoldenholt, um we also published a paper i think it's two years ago now 2020 around the digital tools or digital open science tools or presumable open science tools their limitations and also how they facilitate open science uh, at large across the research workflow and 
yeah, maybe we can end this conversation on this positive and hopeful note. There is a lot of an increasing scale of interoperability of systems across providers also. So providers have come to the same one and same table to mm -hmm. yeah, to interconnect their systems, which naturally have an, have evolved in silos. Um, and now are yeah being interconnected increasingly so and at a, yeah as much as feasible as much as possible and any developments on top will very much look into interoperability and ensure that mm -hmm. to happen so so yeah like you i also see things positively we have a few challenges to tackle through still mm -hmm. um and there's also many people working on these challenges and um yeah using ai using um this research literature discovery tools and algorithms um we still need human components to make sense of data analysis or to verify data analysis um and yeah assess potential and actual biases which surely are there no judgments but as long as we keep aware and become increasingly aware of any potential biases in whatever mm -hmm. system I think that's there's a chance for keeping those minimal and to keep any negative side effects to the minimum to on the contrary have a mostly positive effect <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um yeah the, would you like towards the end of of this episode and like I very much enjoyed the conversation we had and I'm sure there's much more to maybe for a follow-up conversation between us as well. Um, but what, what would you like, how would you summarize or kind of final concluding statement as they say also in, in journals or in journal manuscripts? What's your conclude, concluding statement or outlook from, from this conversation? Um, to conclude, I, I would say again scholarly publishing at the moment is incredibly dynamic and interesting you're seeing significant collaboration between all stakeholders both commercial and academic uh, and we're seeing tools being applied now that are being in, you know are increasingly effective in doing what we intend them to do and it's just a broader understanding of open science that i'm I'm really happy with at the moment that people are gaining a better understanding of what open science is. It, it, it needs to be continually discussed and perspectives shared and perspectives are, are, are important as well. So, so diversity of views around open science and how it works or doesn't work for particular regions. So, you know, again, Africa is like really, really important region for science where there are different practices around science and science funding which needs to be understood needs to be understood in the same way with asia pacific or south america there are different science funding ecosystems that mm. come to play as well which creates a, a diversity that sometimes is not accounted for when we're talking about um bigger issues like open science and needs to be taken into into consideration um but you know this is a very very positive time having gone through a very gloomy time with covid and obviously you know ukraine at the moment it, it mm. you just think could the world just have a break for a while mm. but unfortunately we we have to deal with ukraine but um you know i really want to believe that science can help us through all these dark times and good conversation around science is always helpful and so our podcast has been great today i've enjoyed our conversation um we'll have to do this again on my podcast next week so <laughs> we're going to see i'll be interviewing uh, um, you next pleasure. week um so we'll we uh, we will continue the conversation and then should i come back should you like me to come back on your podcast at some time yes, in the future i'll be very happy very happy to do so um yes so um for the moment thank you very much for uh allowing me to be your guest and um yeah i look, look forward to our next conversation yeah um me too like great yeah, great conversation had and very much looking forward to the next one and yeah also the one on your show next week 
<laughs> okay. Um, so after the next episode. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.